Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of your lovely faces. Um, Emily and I have been gone for the last couple weeks. Um, as some of you know, uh, she and I recently celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary, and we did it by going to Greece. Um, it's something we've been planning for a whole number of years, and uh, it's nice to get away, away from the kids. My parents took the little ones, and the big ones were able to be on their own. So just a wonderful new stage of life. But um, while we were there in Greece, I just spent a lot of time in the mornings reading from the book of Acts and from the book of the books of Corinthians and uh, Thessalonians and Philippians and all these other books that are in a sense geographically based there in Greece. So, it's, And it was pretty neat just to have the pages of scripture come to life in that way. So if you will humor me today, we are actually going to be uh, talking on the topic of missions, but we're going to do it out of the book of Acts in Acts chapter 17. Um, so if you wouldn't mind opening up your Bibles um, to Acts 17. And we're going to look at this idea of missions based on a sermon Paul gave in Athens. So, so as you're turning there, pray with me. Father, we thank you that we can come this morning to worship you. Thank you that in the midst of this, part of our worship is being able to celebrate the work that you are doing in the lives of certain individuals, and in Abby, and Laura, and Darcy. Um, these are not just events and, and religious things that, that we are, are participating in, but they are a reflection of your actual work in their lives. And so it's because of that we can rejoice and as a church family, uh, celebrate. Oh, thank God, now as we open up your word, we do want to continue with that, that heart of worship, that heart of celebration, um, knowing that your word is given to us to speak to us, to challenge us, to change us, to make us more like Jesus. Um, and so God, I ask that you'll do that today. I pray that our hearts will be open uh, to what you have to teach us. So, God, may my words be your words. Um, yeah. And make us as a church, a church that has a missional heart, a heart for the lost, uh, both here and around the world. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I know a lot of you know that over the last semester, uh, the church hosted a perspectives class, a class on uh, missions, a 15-week class. Uh, there were about 15 of us that were able to participate in that. And um, even as somebody who's been involved in missions full-time for the last 28 years, I felt like God was speaking to me and to others in very fresh ways about who he is and what he's called us as a church to do. And one of the things that we heard, um, Drew, please help me. There you go, there you go. One of the things we heard was this quote from John Piper from his book, Let the Nations Be Glad. This, this idea that missions exist because worship does not. Now think about that for a second. Like, you know, what does that mean, that missions exist? Because the idea, the word missions doesn't even exist in the Bible itself in the way that we often think about it. But this idea of going and being intentional, of telling other people about Jesus, because that's what we think of, that's how we understand the word missions, of being intentional, of going and telling people about Jesus, that exists because worship does not. That throughout the world, there are men and women and cultures and nations and people and people groups that do not worship the true God. 
And because they don't, there's this idea of missions, of having to go to tell them about the true God so that they can worship God. And that's why that exists. That's why we as a church even want to focus and emphasize this idea of missions, both locally and globally. So we as a church, in our, in our value statement, say that we hold true this idea of global missions. Again, another word that doesn't really truly exist, local. But it says that we believe that God's mission compels us to transform communities at home and abroad, so locally and globally, through proclaiming and living out the good news of God's lavish, unconditional, transforming love in Jesus. That we as a church want to be telling the world, the world that's close to us and the world that's far from us, about God's love and salvation that can only be found in Jesus. And so that's who we are, what we're about. This is what we are trying to do. That we are a church that values global missions. So if you're, you have your Bibles open to Acts 17, we're going to look at just one little example of, of Paul's ministry where he's doing missions. And so, I don't know, this is kind of a long passage. We're going to start reading in, in verse 16. I don't know. My daughter asked if I was going to be engaging today, so I don't know how engaging this will be. But what I'm going to do to keep you uh, engaged is to have you stand up while we read this together, okay? So follow along with me while we read Acts 16, and I think we're going to be going all the way through verse 32. Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears. We want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring... We should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice 
by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on the subject. And at that, Paul left the council. And some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. You may be seated. Now, like I said, when I was reading this while actually in Athens, it, it kind of helped make the pages of Scripture come alive a little bit uh, in, a, in a fresh new way. So, again, humor me just a little bit. I'm going to show you some pictures from our trip. Not, not to show you pictures from our trip per se, but just to give you a little bit of context uh, so you have an idea of what this is. So, you're all familiar a little bit with, like, the famous thing in Athens, you know, the, the Acropolis and that. So... Let's see, how can I do this? Can I do this? There. All right, so there's the Acropolis there. Right here is Mars Hill, the Areopagus. So not far from this. Here is the marketplace, which is the, the ancient Agora, the marketplace where people would go. Um, so it's, it's kind of close. This is, you know, in the first century AD, the... the uh, Acropolis and the, the temple up there was at around 300 B.C., right? Um, she remembers these things better than I do. So, um, and it was, it was a pretty exciting thing to actually be on Mars Hill. So this is the view of Mars Hill from the Acropolis, and this is Mars Hill looking up at the Acropolis. So um, it was just pretty exciting. I, I tried to walk in every little spot of that stone hill just to say that I stood someplace where Paul stood, um, which was pretty tricky because it's a very slippery stone hill. So, and, and it's, as you can see, there's some pretty steep drops from it too. So, um, but uh, just a, a pretty cool thing to be where Paul was. But here, here's some context for this passage here. Paul is on his second missionary journey. He's in Greece. He's gone from Thessalonica up in the north, which unfortunately Emily and I didn't get to go to. Um, he went down to Berea, which is a little bit further south from Thessalonica, Thessalonica and north of Athens, um, where he'd, Berea had been run out of town. So he kind of is brought to Athens while he's waiting for Timothy and Silas to show up. And so while he's there in Athens, walking around the Agora, as most people would do, you know, that's the marketplace, he's making observations. He's thinking, how can I be missional in this place where I am? Even though I was thinking I was going to be in, in Berea or some other place, but I'm here. So how can I use this to honor and glorify God? And so here he is in Athens, where for the past 300 years or so, been the intellectual center of the world. You know, Athens is the home of Socrates and Aristotle and Plato. And he's walking around, and he's distressed by what he sees. He sees this city that's full of idols, you know, some estimated that there were between 25,000 and 30,000 statues. Now, of course, when we were there, none of them had heads and none of them seemed to have hands. So maybe in that first century, some of them might have still had heads or hands, but, you know, 300 years, probably could have fallen apart. But, you know, Athens, the uh, Acropolis there, the, the, the whole center of worship, it's home to 12 major Greek deities, including Zeus and Apollo and, you know, one first century Roman uh, courtier said that it was easier to find a god in Athens than it was to find a man, which even nowadays, it's pretty much true. Every shop has statues of all the Greek gods and goddesses and, you know, now most people aren't getting them to worship them per se, but they, 
They're everywhere. Um, and Paul goes around and he sees this. He sees all these statues, these objects of worship that are not of the true God, and he's distressed by this. I love the fact that Paul, when he sees something that is contrary to the worship of the true God, rather than just writing it off or thinking nothing of it, it causes some distress in his heart. Even I, at a certain point, as as we are walking around and visiting all these other different archaeological sites, thinking, how these are all the same, and no wonder that an earthquake knocked down all these temples, because I'm pretty sure God was pretty ticked at it and, and said, enough's enough. But as Paul sees all this, he's distressed. But his distress didn't just say, well, yeah, gosh, I'm just going to go home and pray about it, or, or what can we do? It led him, in verse 17, to start having dialogues and debates with people there in the town. And his dialogues and his debates took him to some very specific places. Started off first in the synagogue. Of course, go where the religious leaders were, the influencers, the Jewish community who weren't worshiping those idols. But he went there first. But then after that, he went into the ancient agora. He went into the marketplace, which now is just a bunch of rubble. And some paths and some signs that say this might have been this or this was this. But, you know, it would have been nice to see what it looked like at the time. But Paul's there and he goes into the marketplace and his conversations were with those who happened to be there. With anyone who would listen to him. He went to where people were talking. It was like he was going to the universities where people are talking about different philosophies and different things, different worldviews. It's like going to the barber shop and sitting down and having a conversation and just listening to all the, the, the city gossip. Like going to the coffee house or maybe the park or standing around the water cooler at work. He went to where he knew people were going to be having conversations. But of course, in the midst of these conversations, there were people who were going to be dissenters. There were people who were going to have different views. And I'm pretty sure Paul was eager for that type of conversation. And so th- this passage here, starting in verse 18, talks about two different groups. There were the Epicureans and the Stoics. And before we think that those are ancient philosophies that no longer exist, uh, these two philosophical worldviews are very strong in our culture today. We might not call it Epicurean philosophy or Stoic philosophy, but this way of thinking is alive and well today. The Epicureans believed that the chief end of man is pleasure. Not like hedonism, that was eat, drink, and be merry, but pleasure in the sense of tranquility and freedom, freedom from fear, absence from pain. Like having just the good things in life. Like being happy is the most important thing. Sound familiar with some of our worldview today? The Epicureans also believe that everything happens by chance. You know, if there's anybody who believed in Murphy's Law, it was the Epicureans. But they also believed that there was no life after death, and that the gods were distant and uninterested in man's affairs, that they had no providential relationship to the world itself. And Paul addresses that in verses 25 26 and 27 of his sermon. So you had the Epicureans on one hand, and then on the other hand, you had the Stoics. And the Stoics believe that the gods 
were everywhere. They were in all things. Which, certainly in Athens, because of all the statues, they had God's word everywhere in that regard. But, but even though the gods were everywhere, they were also impersonal. And the Stoics believed that life had a fatalistic ending. So sort of their common phrase would have been just something like, well, just, just grin and bear it. You know, whatever will be, will be. This too will pass. But they believed of a life of individual independence. You, you just don't trust anyone. And so these two groups, these two worldview philosophies, took him up to the Areopagus, took him up to Mars Hill, place of prominence. It was also a place where there was courts and trials and things there. And so hearing Paul talk about these things, you know, where it was illegal to be introducing foreign gods, there was probably a little bit of a trial there and a little bit of a, you know, let's, you know, curiosity, let's hear what's going on. But in his very proactive attempt to engage with people there, that led those people to ask, what does this mean? We don't get it, so we want to hear a little bit more. And maybe their intention was, you know, to put them in jail or something if it was contrary to what they needed. Or maybe it was a real sense of, this is interesting. You know, teach us more. Maybe there's some truth to this. But either way, because he was intentional, he went to where people were talking, and he engaged with them. They wanted to hear more. So Paul had a, a fairly simple strategy when it came to this. He found some common ground with them. In verse 22, it says, I see that in every way you are very religious. Of course, with all the idols in the city, you know, there are 30,000 statues of gods and goddesses around there. It would be pretty hard-pressed to not see the fact that they had some religious stuff there. But, and certainly with a, a big temple in the background up on top of a hill, you can see that there are religious community. But he found some common ground. There was a religious thing. They were religious. Paul was religious. And so he used that as an entry point into it. Unfortunately, too often we today, when we engage in conversation with people, and why sometimes maybe we find it very difficult to have conversations with people who don't share our faith, is that rather than starting with common ground, we begin with our differences. You think about having a conversation with Catholics. And sometimes the very first thing we go to is, well, gosh, you worship Mary, or you idolize Mary, or you have all these saints that you look at, and we don't do that. And so, you know, and you start with the differences. And while those differences are true and they're real and they, they are a barrier to get over, starting there doesn't open the door, doesn't create a bridge to the gospel. Stressing differences does, not, does very little to improve dialogue. In fact, it usually hinders it. So he, he started with the common ground, but the common ground came from the fact that he had some very careful observation as he was walking through the city. It says that he walked around and looked carefully at what was around him. Paul studied them. He took interest in them. They weren't just a project for him or thing on his list of, well, I, I, I just need to share my faith, and so I don't care where they are or, or where they're coming from. I'm just going to go and tell them about Jesus. That is one strategy. 
But Paul's strategy was to take interest in the people that he was talking to. To see what places he can connect with. And then use those things to bridge into what is true. And in his observation, he saw this, this altar to an unknown God. And I, I read a little bit about this and whether or not this is the exact origin of this altar to the unknown God. But during a plague that happened long before Paul's time, uh, None of the altars within that city, none of the religious artifacts of worship were able to successfully propitiate the gods to get rid of this, this plague. Like nothing they did could stave off this plague. And so, you know, they prayed to, to Zeus and to all the other things and any other gods that they could think of, yet this plague persisted, persisted. And finally, in Athens, they offered a sacrifice to an unknown god. And immediately, the plague ended. Now, whether that's the true origin of, of this statue, I don't know. It's the way that I, I, I read it in one of the books. But, but the idea here is that the Athenians were covering their bases. They were covering their behind when it came to, to the worship of God. So they had all the, the gods of their pantheon. And just to make sure that they you know, aren't missing something, they have this, this altar to an unknown god. And that's where Paul starts. Like, what you say is unknown, I'm going to explain to you. And the wisdom for looking for common ground has been used by missionaries over the centuries to bring large groups of people to Jesus. Don Richardson, in his book, Eternity in the Heart, gives an explanation as to why the Protestant church in South Korea grew so quickly and remains strong to this day. As he observed, both the Korean and the Chinese had a knowledge of the true God. But it was unclear to them who or what that was. And their knowledge of this God, or at least the, this, this somewhat understanding that there was a true God that existed, led them to, to say that no images were to be created of who this true God is. And the Koreans called him Hananim, or the Great One. Protestant missionaries recognized right away that their understanding of the true God really was the true God of the Bible. They just didn't know who he was. It hadn't been revealed to them specifically through Scripture. Yet. They didn't have the Scriptures to, to fully understand this. And so those Protestant missionaries use that as a way to bring the gospel to them and appoint them to the God of the Bible. And the response was overwhelming. They took it and they understood it and they came to Christ. And there's a very strong and thriving uh, Protestant church in South Korea today. The Catholic missionaries, on the other hand, had accused the people of idolatry in this matter, which I think is slightly ironic, but, but this, this idea that they had this idea of the true God, but didn't worship him as the true God, and so they said that, well, that was a form of idolatry. And as a result, without realizing it, that created stronger barriers or higher barriers for the Koreans to hear and accept the gospel. And thus, the, the, the presence of the Catholic Church in Korea is much smaller than that of the Protestants. But Paul used this idea of 
bridging with common ground to get to the gospel. And then Paul has this, this sermon in these next 10 verses or so, in verses 23 through 32. And we're not going to spend much time on that here. But notice the bridge that Paul made in his dialogue with the Greeks. He began with where they were, finding a thread of common ground and bridged the gap so as to get them to where he wanted to take them. And after he introduced the thought of this God, he describes the one true God. And his sermon basically has five parts. That God is the creator. That God cannot be contained. That God needs nothing. God is the giver of life, which I think that was for the Epicureans there. And that God is the good news. And as a result, certainly some sneer, just like any time we're going to share the gospel, there will be people who reject it. And I think often all we think about is there will be people who reject it, and so we don't tell people about Jesus at all. But then it says there were some who said, we want to hear more on this. They hadn't accepted it yet, but they wanted to hear more. There was something appealing to them. And then it says here, even so, that there were some who believed. And any time we share the gospel, there are going to be those types of results. There are going to be some who are going to reject it, some who are just curious, don't want to hear more, and then there will be some, some, praise God, there will be some who believe. So why is it important to engage in missions? Well, it's because people from all walks of life, from every culture and every background, are withholding, whether they know it or not, worship of the one true God. That worship doesn't exist. And giving it, giving their worship to a God of their own design. You know, there was a, a Barna study several years back that said that 50 per, 53% of people who read the, the book The Da Vinci Code or saw the movie The Da Vinci Code, you guys remember that from years back? stated that that book, that, that, those movies, had been helpful in their personal spiritual growth and understanding. Interesting that that would be the source of helpful spiritual understanding. There was a recent article on, on fandom.com talking about the impact of the Marvel Cinematic Universe on religion. Think about this. Spider-Man and Doctor Strange in the multiverse and Iron Man and the Snap, which is not a character, it was an event. But, and the Snap have people talking about what is real and what is possible. And that article talks about that there are Christians who feel the need to reinterpret the Bible to account for the existence of alien races and the use of magic in the world. That's the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and people are basing their belief system on that. Uh, 2018, Barna Poll said that 21% of adults worldwide are atheists or agnostic or fall into the none category. But you know what that means? That there's still 79% of people who have some belief, the concept of who God is. Those are common ground ways to go. We can use the Da Vinci Code and the Marvel Cinematic Universe to get to the gospel. People around us are bombarded with lies and half-truths. So I want to go real quickly. I know we're running out of time, but real quickly, 
Our God is a missionary God. And it's on every page of Scripture. This book that we have is not just something that is a religious book or something that we should be bringing to church on Sundays. This is a book that teaches us about the nature and the character of God. And starting on page one, on verse one, it talks about the missional nature of God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That that sentence right there has missional implications. Because God is Lord over all the earth because he is the creator over the whole earth. And the fact that God is the creator of the world means that he is the ruler and the judge of the world. And that all the world stands in relationship with him. In some context of relationship, either in a good relationship or in an isolated relationship. But because of that, though, he's not a tribal God. He's not a Greek God. He's, he's not ruling over a tribe or a nation. He's ruling over the entire world. As theologian John Stott put it in a sermon entitled, The Living God is a Missionary God, he says that since... God is the creator of the universe, the earth and all mankind. We must never demote him to the status of a tribal deity or a petty godling. He goes on to say, he's not like Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, or Milcom or Molech, the god of the Ammonites, or Baal, the male deity, or Ashtoreth, the female deity of the Canaanites. God is the God of everyone. And from the very beginning, God's plan has been to have the entire earth full of people worshiping him. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, we hear the story of Abraham. Even before he was called Abraham, God said, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And all in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God repeated the same promise to Abraham's son Isaac and his grandson Jacob, a promise that all the peoples on earth will be blessed through him and through them and their offspring. Again, John Stott said, we must not suppose that God chose Abraham and his descendants because he lost interest in other people or had given up on them. Election is not a synonym for elitism. On the contrary, God chose one man and his family in order that through them he will bless all the families of the earth. God's heart for the nations was that they would know him and worship him. God chose Abraham and his family to be an instrument to deliver God's blessing to the nations. And it's throughout the Old Testament. God gave the Ten Commandments to the people with a purpose for the world. that they will show his wisdom and understanding to the nations. It's nice I have it up there twice. In Isaiah, it says that I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. In Habakkuk, it says... For the earth will be filled with the knowledge and glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And Malachi, my name will be great among the nations. Further down, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. It's to be everywhere. God's heart has always been for the nations. 
And of course, in the book of Revelation, we know, we talk about that eternity that from every nation, from all tribes and all peoples and languages, there will be people standing before the throne crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne. God's heart is for the nations. And that is our heart as a church, is for the nations. For the people locally. Quickly, let me show you. It's part of the reason why we as a church support the missionaries. They're just some of them serving in Europe. The Dekines and the Dodsons and the Herods. We have three missionaries serving with ABWE. Melissa Friesen, who come back tonight for our family meeting, and you'll get to hear what God is doing in Togo from Melissa. And then we have three sets of missionaries who are based here in the States, but serving internationally. This is who we are as a church. We have a heart to see people reached here locally, And we have a heart to see people reach globally because that is God's heart. That is what God has called us to do as a people. So the question is, how are you doing engaging with the lost? Are your eyes open to the needs of the people around you, to the belief systems of the people around you? Are your eyes open, are your ears open to the conversations people are having? We have to be intentional people. We have to pursue God's heart to reach out to the lost and bring them into the knowledge and saving faith in Jesus. And that's part of the reason why we even come together on the first Sundays to do communion together. It's because we want to remember what Jesus did on the cross, not just for us in this church, but he did this for everybody. And we as a church celebrate because we have trusted Christ in that. And we remember what he did and celebrate that through the Lord's Supper, through communion. So pray with me real quick. And then we are just going to transition into a little bit of time of communion together. Father, thank you for your heart, your heart for the world. And truly, it's because you have a heart for the world that that even we here in this room can be in relationship with you. We weren't a part of your chosen people, but because your chosen people did through those apostles in the first century take the gospel to different corners of this earth that, that we could hear and know and understand these truths. And so God, thank you for saving us and bringing us into that relationship with you. And I pray that we as a church would be just as intentional to take your love and your truth to those around us and to others around the world. So God, we thank you and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.